In this season of giving, many of us open our hearts to those who aren't able to afford everyday essentials. This week, we connect with a man whose personal desire to help others landed him in a role which allows him to make a difference in the lives of tens of thousands of Vermonters. Connect on Vermont PBS is sponsored in part by the Alma Gibbs Donchin Foundation, supporting Vermont institutions that support the underserved and promoting the betterment of life for all. The Vermont Food Bank helps as many as 153,000 Vermonters each year through programs and a network of 225 food shelves and meal sites. The organization's chief executive officer, John Sales, is also a lawyer with a rich history in public service. He's joining us to talk about hunger here in our state. John, thank you so very much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be here, Ryan. Let's get into how hunger happens. What are the factors that lead to hunger? Yeah. Well, how does life happen? It's really, it's really life that causes hunger. Um, anything from a divorce, uh, an illness, um, you know, with the economic collapse, losing your home, just something that throws people off track. You know, a lot of us don't have that kind of cushion. If, if there's something that throws you off, um, say you're self-employed and you get injured and you don't have insurance, well, how are you going to take care of yourself and your family during that period when you can't work? Um, the little savings you have, maybe go to rent and keeping oil in the tank and keeping some gas in the car so you can get around. Food is a flexible part of your budget and so people start cutting back. Mom and dad start skipping meals and uh, trying to keep the kids fed and eventually you, you're going to the food shelf to try and bring everything together. And the statistics are staggering, John. We actually have a graphic which we're going to put up on the screen as we discuss exactly how people are impacted. And this research comes from Feeding America. So if we want to take that graphic, we're going to talk about the difficult decisions that people are forced to make. There you have it up on your screen. 58% of the households you help either have to decide between paying for food or transportation. So they may not be able to get to work to get the paycheck to put the food on the table. 56% of the households you help pay for medical care or meals. That's a staggering statistic. 52% of households you help either feed your family or provide housing for your family. And then 43% of households you help make less than $10,000 a year. And that's a statistic that I think really shocks people. Um, not only here in Vermont, but across the country, the number of people with extremely low incomes, $10,000 a year or less. I mean, I know you're, the viewers here think about how do you live, how do you pay rent and, and heat your house and get around and clothe yourself and then feed yourself also on less than $10,000 a year. It's, it's really kind of astounding. You know, another statistic from that study is 72% of our neighbors who have to make these choices choose to buy cheaper, less nutritious food um, because they can't afford fresh fruits and vegetables and meat. And you wonder about how someone can be um, you know, unhealthy. Um, you think, well, if you eat less, it helps you be healthy, but it's not necessarily the case. You have to make those trade-offs. Right, and you are making those tough decisions. Do I at least eat something so I feel full, so I have the energy to move forward? But there is a big correlation between hunger and disease. Absolutely. As well. Um, we are dealing with that at the Vermont Food Bank. We're working with hospitals now um, with where w the hospitals are identifying patients that are low income and have uh, diet related diseases and we're actually going to the hospitals and basically setting out a farmer's market and helping the folks shop for healthier food. Um, we're all, we are really working hard to bring more and more produce. Uh, to our food shelves and meal sites and our distributions all over the state. It's what the, the neighbors that we serve want, and so we're trying to get more of it. In the last couple of years, we've tripled the amount of produce we distribute, and we're hoping to double it again in the next couple of years. When you set up those food banks yeah. in the community, yeah. how do you regulate who comes in and out of that? Do you just say it's open to the public, whoever feels that they need to take from this can? Mm -hmm. Do you feel that people may abuse that privilege? Well, I, you know, a lot of people talk about that. Um, 
with our network partners, the food shelves and meal sites around the state, those are all independent organizations, and they make the decision of who comes in. Um, what we say at the Vermont Food Bank is, if you go to a food shelf, chances are you need help. Um, there really isn't anything uh, like abuse of the system. It's, it's a real difficult decision to walk into a food shelf or go to a food distribution. And um, we really have a lot of respect for our neighbors that make that choice. So we always say, be as open as you can. When the food bank itself does distributions, say going to a hospital or going to a, a senior housing site, um, we just let people know that, that the food is for those who would struggle to be able to buy it. And people really self-regulate. That's important that they self-regulate and also that there are steps for them to get to where they need to be. There are a lot of them out there. We have another graphic that I want to take right now talking a little bit more about the numbers in the state. As we mentioned before, Vermont Food Bank assists 153,000 Vermonters, 34,000 of those are children, 26,000 of those seniors, one in four Vermonters turn to your organization each year for help and then over 9 million pounds of food distributed in 2014 and that jumped up by 45 percent from 2013. We talk about the numbers here in Vermont. How many people across America? Is it one in seven? Is the number larger on a greater scale? It's, it's about one in six, one in seven. There's about 46 million Americans who don't know where their next meal is going to come from at some time during the year. Uh, it is a huge problem across the country. And it, it spans, it's not an urban problem, it's not a rural problem. And even in Vermont, there's no one place that has more hunger than another. It's spread pretty evenly throughout the state and throughout the country. You know, the challenge is how do we address it? The challenge is um, in a, a rural or urban setting, it's a very different process to get, to get to the folks, you know, get them to the place where they need to be and get the food that they want when they want it and when they need it. How do you address it and also how do you get it to them right. or how do they get to you? You rely heavily on your partners throughout the community and local farms yes. as well. You pull in so much produce from farms who have been generous to donate all sorts of produce to you. So talk a little bit about those partnerships that you have in the community. Yeah, our, our, you know, our network partners are crucial. It's a very symbiotic relationship. We can't do it without them. And really, they rely on the food bank to get a lot of the food. Um, in the community, you, you mentioned the farms. Um, so many farmers are so generous. Uh, I think next year, we'll probably bring in more than a million pounds of Vermont-grown produce that will go to our neighbors. So farmers, if you know, produce can be the wrong size, the wrong shape, the wrong color. It's not going to go to the farmer's market or to the grocery store. And the farmers want their food to be eaten. You know, they, they love growing food for people. And so they donate it to the food bank because they know we'll get it to the neighbors that wouldn't be able to afford it otherwise. And that's so important. This is nutritious. This is locally grown. So you don't get much better than that. There are so many options in the stores where people may be able to go to the dented can bin and pick up produce and vegetables from there. But the fact that there is this local level really helps further farmers demand and it helps them feel as though they're contributing to your cause. You talked a little bit about direct distribution. Yeah. That's relatively new. You've sort of taken this out into the community a little bit more. How are you doing things now and on a grander scale than you have in the past? Well, and the reason for it is not because our, our partners, our traditional partners, don't do a great job. It's the change in the type of food we distribute. So as we've been moving more to fresh food, um, our, our partners, the, a food shelf, which could, which could be anything from uh, the Chittenden Emergency Food Shelf, which is a very professional staffed organization open five days a week, to literally a, a closet in a church basement. Um, handling produce is kind of a specialized task. And, you know, it, it goes bad quickly. So in order to move more produce and get it to people, we've, we've taken on uh, the task of going out into the communities and, as I said, setting up these farmers markets. Um, the challenge and where we work with partners is making sure that we get the people there. 
um, and finding the places like hospitals and, and low-income housing or senior housing uh, where we can partner with a group and get up, get there, set out this beautiful array of produce, a lot of it local, and uh, let people shop. And it's about promoting those events. Absolutely. And while you're at these events, are you educating those who are coming to these events about how to make the most of what they have? Is there any sort of instructional elements that can help them capitalize on what you're providing them? Yeah, you know, I, I always think about this. Um, it's not just uh, people who can't afford food that don't have the cooking skills these days. It's really all of us. Um, what we do when we, when we do the produce distributions, um, we always have nutritional information. Um, and we also have a program called VT Fresh that we do both at direct distributions and also at our network partner food shelves where we go in and actually do cooking demonstrations and have recipes. So whatever we're getting that day, if there's a lot of cabbage and apples, we'll go in and our volunteers will go in or, or staff and slice up some apples and cabbage and maybe do something different. You know, a stir fry with some salt and pepper and, and olive oil and it, it's delicious and people aren't expecting it. Gets them to eat things in different ways. Absolutely. So it is about the education. Absolutely. Another way in which you give back to the community is through the popular backpack program. And we actually have a clip that was locally produced of exactly what this consists of. So we're going to pause for a minute and we're going to take a look at this clip and then we'll come back and speak about that. I think that the way that you change the world is by feeding people and specifically by feeding children. Um, and that's where our backpack program comes in. Our backpack program is a program where we work in a, a variety of different elementary schools in the state and we provide bags of nutritious kid-friendly food that they can take home during during the weekend. And so we started with 130 kids and basically have grown over the past eight or nine years to a thousand kids. And the program is basically just kid-friendly, non-perishable food items that kids can take home on Fridays to, to eat over the weekend so that, you know, when kids are in school, they have breakfast and lunch that they can rely on. But during the weekend, they may not know where their next meal is coming from. Remarkable resource. Yeah. How many people or school districts are able to benefit from this program? Well, it's, it's spread out all over the state. It's about 26 schools this year. Uh, we, we're trying to expand it every year we have for the past few years. And there's a demand to expand. You wouldn't be doing it just because e you every feel like Every school it. wants to have this program. Um, it's really resource constrained. Um, we have to purchase the food because it's special, specially uh, chosen food in very kid-friendly sizes and make sure it's all the right nutritional components for a child's meal. Excellent. And in terms of wanting to expand these programs, the dreams are big, but the reality is federal grants, money, that keeps getting slashed. Yeah. You used to have a partnership with the Department of Corrections, so people from the Department of Corrections would work to package these elements. Right. So you're hoping to put food in more mouths, more meals on the table, but you're working with limited resources that continue to get slashed. How do you plan to not only sustain what you're doing, but build upon what you're already doing? Well, a couple of ways. Um, one is by always asking. Uh, you know, the way to raise money is to ask people to connect with the work that, that our organization is doing. You know, for people to realize that we can really do something about hunger in Vermont. And the Vermont Food Bank is an organization that can be your conduit to, to really helping your neighbors. Um, you're right, the federal programs, uh, the food stamp program, which is called Three Squares Vermont here, has been cut several times in the last few years. And that puts a lot of pressure on families. That's really the first line of defense against hunger in this country. And when those, when those benefits go down, these are families that are already struggling. The next stop is their local food shelf. So we're looking, um, to be more efficient, really, is our other way. Be more efficient and effective. We've been able to increase the amount of food we've distributed, including the amount of produce, and really not incrementally as large increases in our budget. So we're doing the best we can with what we have and asking for more. So this obstacle, you can almost look at it as an opportunity, but do you feel frustrated? Do you feel challenged that you have to think outside of the box and take on new approaches or 
is what you're doing enough? Never frustrated, always challenged. Um, I, would, I couldn't do this work if, if I wasn't really passionate about it. And we have 50 employees at the food bank and every single one of them is passionate about what we do. Uh, it's really, um, I enjoy the challenge of finding ways to do more with less or to do even more with the same amount. Um, so we're always looking for new ways, new partnerships, you know, like working with the hospitals and schools. We've got a new program coming up working with schools to try and uh, leverage the, the food that they serve their students to make sure that all of that food is getting used. Um, there's always something new you can do. You just have to keep looking for it. And now this may be a bit personal, but usually people who want to help have been in a position where they weren't able to give or they were on the receiving end of things. Yeah. Were you ever faced with challenges such as hunger or face any hardships when you were a child? You know, I was very fortunate. Um, we certainly um, weren't wealthy when I grew up uh, with four brothers and sisters, um, but we always had enough food on the table. And, uh, but my parents were always very aware of our community and we were always out there doing things in the community. So I learned at a very young age about giving back, um, you know, having all kinds of people in our home and being out there in the community doing things. Um, so, and I don't, I think some of our best supporters are people who have experienced mm -hmm. hunger or experienced um, real difficulties in their lives. I think we all have in our own ways. Um, but also I think we can, we can find it in ourselves to, uh, to really have that empathy for our neighbors and realize that lifting up everyone in our community lifts us all up. Do you think it is the values that your parents instilled as you and a child that drew you to this line of work? Did you always feel that you wanted to give back? You know, I, I would say there was, there was a time in my life when I wasn't thinking about giving back. Um, you know, I had my challenges, but mostly yes, it definitely was um, the values my parents instilled in my upbringing that uh, had me always wanting to serve the public. You know, you mentioned I had a, a time in government service and uh, my daddy was a bureaucrat, I like to say. He, he worked for the federal government and I always saw his job as helping people and it's always what I wanted to do. Let's talk about your time yeah. in public service. Do you feel as though once you're a public servant, you're always a public servant? Do you feel you could ever take that hat off and say, I'm stepping away because you are very involved through the food bank and as someone with a background in law, very involved with the government and you've recently been appointed to a board where the state is summoning you for advice. So first question, do you feel as though you'll always play a public servant role and then tell us about the role in which you're currently stepping into? I think I will always be doing something that uh, has to do with public service. It, by this time in my life, it is kind of in my blood. Um, and even if I went to the for-profit sector, I think I would always be involved in things, helping people. Um, and I saw my time in government as really helping people. We have some photos that we just put up on the screen there. There's you with Governor Shumlin. Now, what is this event? There were spoons that were staked out on the State House lawn. So what this, was that? This was Hunger Action Month. Okay. It's a national event that's put on by Feeding America, you mentioned, and we're a, a member of the Feeding America Network. And there are 153,000 Vermonters that rely on the Vermont Food Bank. Uh, orange is the, the color of Hunger Action Month, so we, we took 15,300 orange spoons and put them in the State House lawn, one to represent every 10 Vermonters who is struggling with hunger in our state. That's a powerful picture, not just it because is. of the contrast of color, but because of what it symbolizes Absolutely. as well. Let's get back to the Vermont Food Bank for a moment. You applied for the position that you're in now in 2007, and it didn't go that's right. the way you wanted it to. Did you actually get through the interview process and then they decided to pursue another candidate or did it not get that far? No, I was interviewed and um, didn't get the job. 
that was okay. I was, I was doing a job that I was giving back in. Um, they chose someone who, after a while, um, and he was there for 18 months, and it just didn't work out. You know, some people, Vermont's not the right place for them. Um, and I had the opportunity to try it again. And I think it gave me some time to really think more deeply about what I wanted to do with my life, and also some experiences that I had in that 18 months um, in Vermont made me, I think, a richer candidate, a better candidate. And I gotta say, this is the best job I've ever had. Um, I've never been so fulfilled and excited every day when I get up to go to work. Did the original rejection resonate with you? Did you sort of take a step back? We've all heard no before, yeah. and no can either motivate us more yeah. or it could completely turn us off. So when it didn't go as planned, mm -hmm. were you frustrated or did you say, hey, just not my time? Well, I think the latter. And you know, having been an attorney and working in government, um, it's, it's often like fundraising. When you hear no, it really means not now. Um, so I did realize it, it just wasn't the time then. And, and really thinking, as I do often if, in the jobs I've had, if, it's, if, if that organization didn't choose me and I feel like I put my best foot forward, it's just because it wasn't the right fit then, probably for me as well as for them. Sure. And while with the Vermont Food Bank, since you've stepped into this role, you've really, not spearheaded, but you've taken a program which is called the Community Kitchen Academy yeah. that has gone to a whole nother level okay. with your involvement so Community Kitchen Academy there are some photos up on the screen yeah. right now it's another way in which you give back to Vermonters you take unemployed or underemployed Vermonters and educate them you take them right into the kitchen what does this course consist of yeah uh, first of all let me say that all I had to do was unleash my staff. They are fabulous to make, all, to make everything work better. Um, the Community Kitchen Academy is a 13-week culinary training course, as you said, for unemployed and underemployed Vermonters. Um, it really transforms lives. It, my favorite thing in my job is to go to graduations and listen to the students talking about their experience in, in CKA. Um, just really quickly, there was a, a, a student, Charles, and Charles had, had, had been divorced and his life had gotten kind of challenging. He had worked in kitchens before. Um, so, I, you know, things were not going well for him. Charles got in, in CKA, went through the program, really reignited his passion for food. He got a job in uh, one of our fancy restaurants in Burlington as a pastry chef um, and really got his life back on track. And that's what CKA is about. And while they're doing that, the students are taking food that's rescued, food that would otherwise go to waste, and turning it into meals that are then served through food shelves. So they're, they're serving, uh, the students are serving their neighbors, literally, um, while at the same time learning job skills. And uh, over 90% of the students that get through the, the program either get another job or continue on with hard, higher education. And I say higher education because this is a college level course and the students are eligible for nine college credits when they graduate. They walk away with so much. They walk yeah. away with empowerment, they walk away with an education. And, and we walk away with, with a, a really a community that's enriched. You know, the, the, the experience that that student has, um, like the pebble in the pond, you know, it radiates out to their family, their friends, and their community. Now it's not cheap no. to put this program on. It costs nearly $500,000 and that's at each location. So how is this bill covered? Is this covered by any government funding? Is this from everyday donors? Yeah, we do a lot of fundraising for this, but there, there is some support through the state, through uh, job training programs and um, vocational rehabilitation programs. So as with any kind of, of program you're doing in the nonprofit world, you're reaching around and piecing things together um, it's really worth it though, because this program really does transform lives. It does, and we've heard success stories from previous guests as well who have had a hand as a teacher in that role. It is the season of giving, and your website said, as we've talked about before, one dollar can equate to three meals. So if you briefly just want to say how someone can help, how they can contribute. Yeah, I mean, Really what we say is, is donate, volunteer, and advocate. 
So donate. We can turn one dollar into three meals. You know, we love it when people do a, do food drives and go to your local food shelf or bring it to the Vermont Food Bank. The Vermont Food Bank can leverage those dollars in a way that an individual can't. Um, volunteer, we rely on volunteers to make it work. We do, uh, we have about eight full-time employees worth of volunteer work that gets done every year. Lots of corporate groups and lots of work for individuals. Um, right on our website, you can hit the volunteer button and advocate because the way we end hunger in this country and in this state and in our own communities is by being aware of it. Once people are aware of it and aware that there's something that they can do, people start acting. So tell your neighbors you saw this program and, uh, and that hunger is out there and there's something we can do about it. John Sales, that's your call to action. I thank you so very much for joining us today, talking about your mission, how it's going to move forward, where it's been, and where it's going to go. So I thank you so much for joining us. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. I want to thank you at home for joining us as well. Vermont PBS would like to connect with you. Feel free to reach out with feedback and ideas at connect at vermontpbs.org. You can also check out other episodes and extra material at the Vermont PBS website. We'll see you next time. Connect on Vermont PBS is sponsored in part by the Alma Gibbs Donchin Foundation, supporting Vermont institutions that support the underserved and promoting the betterment of life for all.